Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone out this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning here at Beverly Hills. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, the first is that uh, last Sunday we had our deacon election. And many of you may or may not have heard, but our new deacons for the upcoming 21 year is Randy Wren and John Marks. And so I'm very excited to be working. Uh, all four names that were listed uh, were wonderful candidates, uh, but we're excited to have them come on and rotate as in for new, two new deacons for the 21 year. Uh, also, if you will look over here at the table, you will see a red wrapped box. This is a ministry that is being done by the PD Association WMU. And they are taking up a little travel-sized deodorants that will be used uh, in the women's prison this coming up this Christmas. And so if you are out and about and you go uh, Walmart or wherever you may be doing some shopping, uh, food line, whatever it may be, uh, if you come across a little travel-sized deodorants, I think that's about the size we're looking for. Um, are they two, two and a half to three and a half ounces? Okay. So two to three and a half uh, ounces, which it'll say uh, on the actual deodorant, what size they are. Uh, they're going to be taking these up and collecting them. Uh, there'll be over 1,500 plus red boxes throughout all 100 counties in the state of North Carolina that the WMU is taking up. So if you just happen to come across it, if you just pick one up and then bring it to church on Sunday, drop it in a box, that is a wonderful ministry that uh, the WMU is doing uh, for the PD Association. Also, uh, if you have any prayer requests, uh, you can feel free to fill those out and drop them in our offering plate. We'll update that weekly. Uh, if you would like to uh, get a bulletin in the mail, if you're not able to get one, or if you know someone, uh, a shut-in who would like to get a bulletin that is not, please just let us know. We we'll email a bulletin and a prayer list to them so that they can uh, be updated on everything that is going on. Uh, but it is a, a beautiful day to be in the Lord's house. If you will just stand and wave at one another, if you feel like bumping elbows, you can do that. But just uh, greet one another and say hello. bulletin this morning. If you will open that up uh, inside, you will have a, a few inserts, but the one that I am struggling to pull out here is the prayer list. 
Uh, we update this weekly, so if there are names on the prayer list that you would uh, like to be added, please let us know. Again, you can fill out a prayer request uh, uh, over here on the table, drop an offering plate. You can call it in to the church here, uh, and we will add those names to the list. Uh, just continue, if you will, to remember uh, the uh, uh, family of, uh, excuse me, the family of uh, Miss Jean Brown. Uh, with the loss of her brother, if you will continue to remember them. Also, if you will continue to remember uh, Phyllis Scarborough, uh, she was added to, to our list. Uh, she had taken a nasty spill, and uh, they are doing some MRIs, and they seem to think that she may be having uh, a few strokes, a few mini strokes. So if you will continue to lift her up uh, in your prayers, uh, and continue to remember all of those names that are added on the prayer list. Uh, we want to lift them up. Also, Continue to pray for our country, our nation, uh, everyone around us. And uh, something that I would encourage you to pray, something that I have been laid on my heart that I've been praying very recently, is that the Lord will open up the doors for a revival, a great awakening, if you will. Uh, I feel that uh, in our time, uh, we are prepared and we are ready for a great awakening, a time that there's going to be a great spiritual movement. Uh, and so that has been my prayer uh, here for the past while, and I noticed that that is starting to be the prayers of other pastors and other churches all across the United States, that we will see a rising up of the gospel and have a resurgence. And so if you will just continue to remember all of those, uh, and as we go to our Lord uh, this morning in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, and we love you, and we praise you. When we come to you to first say thank you for letting us gather here to worship you in song and praise. We thank you that we can sing songs to your honor and glory, that we can hear the preaching of your word. And that, Father, even though we are still in quarantine here and there and we are uh, still struggling with all the things that are going on in our world today, we know that you are still King of kings and Lord of lords, that you are still on the throne. And we pray, Father, that you would be honored and glorified. We pray for all the names that are on our prayer list today, for those new names that will be added and those names that were added to those, Father, who have been on there for a while. Those who are facing financial struggles because of the virus to those who have just common illnesses to those who may be looking at the end of life. And, Father, for those in our church family who have lost loved ones, we pray that you would move in each and individual situation. That you would lay on the hearts and minds of those uh, love, grace, and mercy, but direction and guidance. Bringing healing to those, Father, whom you see fit, and peace to those who need it most. Father, we pray for our country. Uh, we pray for our, our city, our state, our country, our nation. We pray, Father, that you would move in a mighty way, keeping those safe who are working the front lines. We pray that you would just protect them and watch over them. <clears throat> Father God, we pray for the world around us. Father, as we are continuing into the 2020 year, and only you know what is uh, the future to be held, we pray that you would just let a resurgence of the gospel come. Too long have we turned our back. Too long have we lived in darkness, but instead shined away from the light. Too long, Father... Have we neglected your word? And I pray that you will begin to move in the hearts of everyone, every person in this world, that you will begin to do a work. And Father, those who you will call your children, we pray that you would uh, lift them and give them the faith to believe. We pray for those who are the family of Christ, those who are brothers and sisters, that we would be light into this world, taking the gospel. We pray for a great awakening, for a resurgence, for a revival to break out. And Father, it, it would be wonderful if it would start here in Beverly Hills and would carry on. But wherever it starts, wherever it may be, we pray that you would be honored and glorified. That your name would be lifted up, that hearts would be turned from the darknesses and would see the light. That you would save the souls of men. And that, Father... When you save the souls, that one day we will celebrate. And Father, we know that one day you will return. Father, we look forward to that returning. When you will come and you will open up the eastern sky. And in that day, sorrow and sadness will be canceled away. 
death will be conquered, we can look forward to spending eternity with you. We love you. And we praise you. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. The words to the song I'm going to sing this morning are very old. It was written in a poem hundreds of years ago, and um, the second verse is my favorite. It says, O oh, fearful saints, new courage take. The clouds that you now dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. And it reminds us, too, it says, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. God is for us. He is with us. And no matter how bad things look, we have hope that he's making it all right. i 
open your Bibles with me to Psalm 64. Psalm 64 will be our focus for our sermon this morning, verses 1 through 10. Psalm 64. My question for you this morning is this. Has anyone ever spoken ill of you? Has anyone ever spoken ill of you? Let me phrase it a little different. Have you ever been the subject of gossip? Has anybody ever talked about you? Anybody ever badmouthed you? What if we turn the tables for just a moment? Have you ever spoken ill of someone? Have you ever gossiped about someone? Have you ever badmouthed someone? That gets a little deeper, don't it? That gets a little harder. You know, they're like, wait a minute now, we, we didn't come to church. We didn't. We're in a pandemic and a quarantine. You won't talk about us talking about people. That's not easy. Now, chances are you've never maliciously spoken bad about someone on purpose. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, right? But also chances are you probably have gotten aggravated in a situation and probably said something that you probably shouldn't have. Now, I'm not calling you out by pointing a finger. What happens when I point a finger at anybody? I got three fingers pointing back at me. I'm just as guilty of this. I learned a very important lesson very early on in my ministry. I learned to run something through a filter. You've heard me say this time and time again, and I'll continue to say it. I will preach this until the day I die. Does this need to be said? Does it need to be said by me? And does it need to be said by me now? Those three things must be met before you should speak about something. Whether it's uh, something that you feel very passionate about, whether it's uh, talking about, whether it's talking about someone or something, some situation, whatever the case may be, whatever it is, does it need to be said, said by me and said by me now? Those things can make the difference between a testimony. Those things can make the difference between a person's integrity. Uh, when we were all children, we would say the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. What we really should have said were sticks and stones may break our bones, but words cut to the core. My mama would always tell me this. She had two lessons that she tried to ingrain into me. If you've heard this, you'll know. God gave you two ears and one mouth, so listen twice as much as you speak. Right? The other one was, if you can't say something nice, don't say something at all. That's exactly right. When we get into Psalm 64, we see a different type of hymn, a different type of psalm that David is going to sing. All of the ones thus far that we have seen David speak about have been more of a physical attack. David was the king of the United Kingdoms. Uh, before uh, the kingdom split into Israel and Judah. And, and as being king, David faced a lot of scrutiny. Uh, and in, for the most part, he faced a lot of physical danger. But in this psalm, Psalm 64, uh, David uh, sings about the, the use of words by the intended world. The, the use of words and how words can be just as bad as a physical threat. The first thing that I would like us to take a look at this morning is the maleficent intentions of the wicked. The maleficent intentions of the wicked. Psalm 64 to the choir master, a psalm of David. David sings, hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from the dread of the enemy. Now this psalm in verse 1 starts out probably just as any other psalm that David has written. He cries out to God and he says, Lord, hear my complaint, hear my words, uh, preserve me and my life from the dread of my enemy. The word dread can be translated as terror. Uh, Lord, preserve my life from the terror of my enemies. Now, David, again, being the king of the United Kingdom, faced an extreme scrutiny. Uh, if you will think back in Old Testament history, there were judges at one point and the people of Israel cried out, God, give us a king. And God said, no, you don't want a king. The people cried out, give us a king. God said, you don't want a king. A king will take your daughters for wives. He will take your sons for labor. 
He will take uh, 50, 90, uh, whatever you have, he will take for his own. You don't want a king. And the people cried out, give us a king. And God said, okay, I'm going to give you what you asked for. Their words were very intentional. Give us what we want. We deserve it. And God said, okay. He gave them a king. Who was the first king of, uh, of Israel? You want to take a jump at it? Begins with an S, ends with an all. Saul? That's right. Saul was king. Saul was a horrendous king. Uh, he did a many a terrible thing. So much, in fact, that God rose David up to take over the kingdom before Saul had even passed away. Saul's own children did not take over the kingdom. God rose up David. Now David comes in in a midst of turmoil. The Jews and the Philistines are at a war. The Israelites and the Philistines. David comes in. He slays Goliath. This giving him a way in to be with the kingdom. Uh, David finally sits at the feet of Saul until Saul finally is removed from the kingdom and David takes the kingdom. David now being king faces a lot of physical scrutiny. Uh, Saul wanted to see him dead because Saul still had followers of David. Uh, David also had his own children rise up to take the kingdom from him. David here uh, sings, Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Uh, preserve my life from the terror of my enemies. Everything seems to be as a normal hymn, crying out God to protect him physically. But then he says, hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the throngs of the evildoer. The word throng means uh, mob. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the mob of evildoers who wet their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows. This word wet in the Hebrew means to sharpen. Lord, protect me from those who sharpen their tongues like swords and who aim at bitter words like arrows. They shoot from the ambush of the blameless, shooting at him suddenly and without fear. They hold fast to their evil purposes. They talk of lying snares secretly. David turns it from a physical attack to the words that are now coming. Now again, if you will imagine David being king of Jerusalem, being king of Israel, he is the king of the United Kingdom. There were many nations that did not like the Israelites, the Philistines, the Assyrians, many, many who did not like them. Instead of doing a physical attack, because it seems like that's what always seemed to take place in the Old Testament was a physical war. Now we start to see what we call psychological warfare. Those within the encampment of those kingdoms begin to realize that if they begin to talk bad about David, if they can persuade David's followers not by force of arms but by words, they can begin to turn David and his kingdom upside down. Now, could you imagine what it took to get the word of mouth spread back then from person to person to person? Now think about that today. With the invention of the telephone, things changed. You can pick up the phone and you can call someone and you can start to complain about them. Man, I don't like the job they do. How easy is that? Man, I didn't like that pastor's sermon. He stepped on my toes. Now, we are so speed up that we don't even use phones anymore. We don't call. How many of you call anybody? How many of you have a choice you're going to call or are you going to text message? Text message. My generation is the text message, the IG generation. Man, I'd rather send a text message. It's a little bit more personal. I don't have to talk to someone, but I get my point across. Then you have email. And then God forbid you have social media. How many of you are on some sort of platform, uh, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook? Information spreads quicker than a wildfire. You can post one thing and it'll get a thousand likes before you can imagine. David writes this in saying, God, uh, please protect me from those who sharpen their tongues like swords. Uh, if you know anything about the swords of that time period, they were short, they were double-edged, and they were sharp. It cuts quick. That's exactly what words today will do. We post something on social media, it's out there. You can't. You can delete the post, but it doesn't matter. It's out there. 
When you say something about somebody, it's out there. Once it's said, it can't be taken back. I saw uh, an illustration one time of a father who was talking to his children about the words that they had said to another child and upset them. And he gives them a, a tube of toothpaste. And he says, I want you to take this toothpaste and I want you to squeeze the whole thing out. Man, kids love that. Man, they have toothpaste everywhere. Boink, and toothpaste goes everywhere. Right? That's easy. Boink, and toothpaste is everywhere. Now, take the toothpaste, put it back in the tube. Now, how easy is that? Once you say something, you can't take it back. It's out there. David explained that these words, they're dangerous. The, the maleficent intentions of the wicked, they, they look to hurt those just by the words they say. They wet their tongues like swords. They aim their arrows. They aim bitter words like arrows. They speak them to specifically tear someone down. Shooting from the ambush at the blameless, those who do not deserve it, yet they still speak ill of them. Shooting at them suddenly and without fear, they hold fast to evil purposes. They talk about lying snares secretly, thinking to themselves, who can see them? They search out injustice. The words that they specifically do are to tear down. Your words can do one of two things. They can build or they can tear down. Here the wicked... They want to do nothing but tear one another down, saying, we have accomplished a diligent search. A uh, better is we have devised the perfect plan. David finishes up the first part of this song by saying, for the inward mind of the heart of men are deep. A better word to translate is, for the inward mind of the heart of man is cunning. Man specifically wants to tear one another down. It's so much easier to talk bad about someone than it is to build somebody up. We're all guilty of this. Not one of us. Even your pastor up here in the pulpit. We're all guilty of this. It's easier to say something critical. It's easier to criticize. We even try to say, well, we call it sometimes constructive criticism. But no doubt it's still... Criticism. It's easy for us to say things that are hurtful instead of to build up. That's why I am such a big proponent of public praise but private criticism. I don't want to ever tear somebody down. I don't want to ever be seen as saying something negative about someone. It's okay to disagree. I understand that. I'm not going to always get along. You're not always going to get along. We're all one gigantic Christian family. We're all in the body of God, correct? We nod our heads on that. We're all family of God. But we won't always get along. And we can understand that. But it's the intentions that we have with that. Do we want to tear each other down or do we want to build one another up? You see, in this first part, we see the maleficent intentions of the wicked. But there's also the masterful intervention of the Lord. Now David's going to sing as God intervenes. But God shoots his arrows at them. And they are wounded suddenly. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues turned against them. All who see them will wag their heads. Then all of mankind's fears, everything that man fears, they tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. Here David uh, sings about how then God, when God sees this, God will shoot his arrow at them and they are wounded suddenly. A little bit about uh, warfare in ancient biblical. When you shoot an arrow up and into uh, in the medieval times, when you shot an arrow, you had to shoot it in a specific place. Because if you had on any type of armor, especially in the Old Testament, armor of uh, thick leather could be penetrated by an arrow. Sometimes it would go through, sometimes it would bounce off. Uh, when you would shoot an arrow at someone, it had to be precise and direct. Here, David says that when God shoots his arrow, they are wounded suddenly. The word of God is much stronger than the words of humankind. The judgment of God, the wrath of God is much stronger than what you will face from someone else. If I had to stand before criticism, I would rather stand and be found faithful to God than to stand against someone else. 
God will be our vindicator. God will be our justifier. God shoots his arrows at them and they are suddenly wounded. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues and turned against them. Here he explains that those who seek to speak evil, those who use words for malicious intent, eventually it will catch up to them. I've seen it too many times where someone who has a bitter spirit, who uses words to tear others down, eventually have that come back to them. And they see themselves, and they're not happy with the person they are. They're not happy with how they've reacted. And they see that what they've done was wrong. He says, all of those who see them will wag their heads. They will shake their heads in shame. They shake their heads because they see what they've done. They realize that they use words to tear others down. And it was shameful. It was wrong. He says, and then all of mankind's fears, all of mankind's fear, everything that mankind fears will come to be. Uh, in the end of this world, when we go through and Jesus has returned, the millennial reign has taken place and is now for the time of the great white throne judgment. God is going to judge the wicked from the righteous and he is going to cast the wicked out. The righteous will then stand as strong. But then there's going to be the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Danny talks about this, and I love hearing Danny when he talks about this. This bema seat, this bema seat is going to be the judgment of the believers. And in this bema seat, in this judgment of believers, God is going to list, I got shudders on this, God is going to list everything that you've ever done wrong. Every malicious word you've ever spoken, everything you've ever seen, every intention you've done, God is going to list and you're going to see it. You're going to know every sin you've ever committed before a righteous God, and God's going to be there showing it to you. Then all of mankind's fears, and then they will tell what God has brought about and has pondered what he has done. No sin will ever be hidden from a righteous God. Nothing you've said, nothing you've done can ever be hidden. I fear the day that i got to stand before God and see my unrighteousness laid before me. God has his masterful intentions. Lastly, we see the meaningful inflections of the righteous. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exalt. This verse is what we would almost equate to in the New Testament as but God. Paul writes in Romans, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. For no, not one are righteous. But then he has two great words. I had to write a whole paper on two words. But God. But God, here, let the righteous rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because we have been found righteous. Yes, our sins will be displayed. Our unrighteousness will be shown. But guess what? That unrighteousness is covered in the righteousness of God. The meaningful inflections, the words that we can do, we praise God. Why? Because he's covered those sins up. He's forgiven us. The righteous, the, the, the great white throne, that's already happened. The unrighteous, the wicked, they're cast into hell. But the righteous one, he will rejoice in the Lord. He will take refuge in the Lord. Why? Because God is a great God. He is a sheltering God. He is a forgiving God. He is a justifying God. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exalt. In case you haven't noticed, that you, that you, brothers and sisters in Christ, exalt God, be exalted, let up your hearts, be lifted and praise to God. Why? Because all of these things that we've just discussed will be forgiven and are forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is through the forgiveness of sin through Jesus that we can stand against a righteous God. Why can we stand before a righteous God? Because we are righteous in Jesus. I want you to take a moment and look at how this hymn is broken down. There are six verses about the wicked. There are three verses about God. And then there is one verse 
about the righteous. What does that tell you? It tells you this. That there's going to be a whole lot of squeaking and squawking from the, the evil. There's going to be a whole lot of wrongdoing. But God is just and faithful and quick. God doesn't need six verses to explain what's going to happen. He does it in three. But for the righteous, the righteous, we have one verse. One verse. What does that verse say? Rejoice in the Lord and upright Him, uh, exalt Him. We're not to argue with the wicked. We're not to say anything bad about the wicked. We're not, we're not supposed to do that. We're not to go against the wicked here. God will vindicate us. God will take care of that. We're not to turn to God and to complain about them. No, we're to turn to God and what? We're to rejoice. We're to exalt. Why? Because God is worthy of that. You see, there's a whole lot more scripture written about the wicked, but what is the righteous supposed to do? If you got two ears and one mouth, listen more than you talk. If you can't say something nice, don't say something at all. In conclusion, I want you to understand this. The words we use can make or break someone's spirit. The words we use can make or break someone's spirit. I want us to all take a moment, myself included, that when I close us in prayer to seek God and to ask God, where is it that we may have wronged someone in the words we have spoken? Where can we ask for forgiveness? We can always ask forgiveness, first of all, but... Where is it that we've specifically done something wrong? You see, the words that we use, as we say, sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt us. Words can make someone's day, and words can destroy somebody's day. First of all, the things we need to do, just as the Scripture said, is exalt God. And then from there... How can we use our words better for the kingdom of God? How can we use our words for the growth of the kingdom and not to tear it down? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. We praise your holy name. And Father, as we stand and sit before you as a righteous God, we thank you that you have made us righteous. Through the justification of Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you that we can exalt your name. We thank you that we can stand before you. Father God, we pray as we have seen in this beautiful hymn that David has written. How words can sometimes carry more weight than actions. And Father, I pray that you will lay on our hearts and minds where we have done wrong. That you would use us to build up and not to tear down. To encourage one another not to discourage. To love to not hate. Father God, we pray as we are here before you, as we pray for a great resurgence, a great revival. Father, we can only do that when our hearts and minds are in the right place. Search us. And Father God, I pray that if there be any unrighteousness in us, anything where you find fault and we have guilt, that you would begin to bring it in light so that we first can ask forgiveness of that, but then make right the wrongs that we have done. Father God, thank you for Beverly Hills Baptist Church. And for every person here. And to even to those who are our church members who, uh, who do not come because of this virus, we thank you for them. For the members of Beverly Hills and for those who make up this church body. And Father, for all of our brothers and sisters throughout this county, this state, this nation, and this world. For the bride of Christ, we thank you. We thank you for calling us into the family. Father God, we love you, and we praise you, and it is in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. If you will stand as we have our hymn of invitation, if God is speaking to you, listen as he speaks. <laughs>
Brother Jim Wallace, will you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you.